Welcome, everyone. We are ready to get started with our Zeg Talks event. We are so grateful that you are here. We're kicking off Alumni Reunion Weekend. Who's here for Alumni Reunion Weekend? Woo! Well, we've turned on for our alumni that are here. Some of you are already here from many miles away. We've turned on the fall colors for you with just a, a sprinkle of snow as well, just so you got a couple seasons in one trip. Um, but we're so happy to have you home. And we also are welcoming some of our campus partners, some colleagues um, and friends. And um, our baseball team is here as well. A big thank you to them. Wow. Um, we're just so grateful that you're here. If you've been to it, if you've seen a TED Talk, you have an idea of what you're going to see today. These are simple talks and our goal is simple as well. And that is to let you know some of the awesome things our Zags are doing in the world today. And speaking of awesome, how many of you, this is the first time you've been in the Myrtle Woldson Performing Arts Center, is it? What do you think? Pretty awesome? We are pretty proud of it and what it's doing for education, of course, in the performing arts, allowing us to be competitive and advance there. Um, and it's so cool because when we think about you back on campus and this building, it's really because of you that we have it and because of you going out and using your educations, taking them into the world and being the very best ambassadors that we have. And because of that, we're able to innovate and doing that is how we honor your legacy. So big thank you to you all. Our Zag Talks will touch on all of that today. Innovation on our campus in both academics and athletics. So let's get started. Are we ready? Ready? Okay, here we go. Our Gonzaga mission calls us to educate with rigor and excellence, of course, but also with care and concern for others in our world. And that's no small task, especially when we think of other universities. It's not the same as ours always. Um, and so today's speaker is just a shining example of the Gonzaga education at work in the world. She is an engineer, she is an artist, she is so much more. We can't wait for you to meet her. From the class of 2014, please welcome Kat Trong. Kat. Hi, welcome back and welcome back home to myself and several of you others in the crowd. Spokane is home, and though I wasn't born here, I'm a local through and through. After high school, I thought for sure I was set on Montana Tech, but a better financial aid package ultimately landed me 9.8 miles from home, much to my parents' delight and my initial dismay. I was able to come to Gonzaga on a full ride, full need scholarship called Act 6, a leadership-based initiative, one of its simple missions was to create agents of change. I'll be talking about the community I found during my time as an undergrad to present day and ways this mission has played out in parallel with caring for the entire body. During my carefree days as a student here, I spent all my free time either in Herrick or PACAR studying or mostly commiserating with my fellow engineering classmates. Now let me throw a wrench in here. This was in addition to being on the cheer team, and those two words are seldom ever used together in the same sentence, but this is really how my Kira personalis journey began. My traditional Asian parents could not understand why the heck I would want to do anything other than study or get good grades, but my spirit was telling me quite the opposite. I actually did better in school when I was involved with cheer because it forced me to prioritize my time. The practice schedule, as you all know, or some of you know, um, and games were non-negotiable. So naturally, if I didn't study at a certain time, it just wouldn't get done. It was in these two mind and body aspects that I started to understand the importance of caring for the whole person. 
My school pride was channeled a bit differently back then, and as I do some reflecting, it's clear that our Division I basketball team promotes a lot of community engagement. And I think as people start to look deeper, Gonzaga is actually a lot more than our basketball team, contrary to some people's belief. As I've seen this campus transform and grow, even since I graduated a mere five years ago, I have also noticed emphasis on fostering a multifaceted definition of community. This university continues to develop its interdisciplinary collaboration, especially between engineering and business, which was highlighted in the last Gonzaga magazine. After being in the workforce for several years, I see how important being able to collaborate with others truly is. At my job, I've worked with linemen, accountants, vendors, environmentalists, and even lawyers. And let me tell you, each person and work group is very different. Having the skill set to work with diverse personalities is a strength and a growing need in my workforce as well as other career fields. Another way I've seen Gonzaga develop community is by breaking students out of their college bubble through different service opportunities in their Center for Community Engagement, formerly known as CASEL. I started as a work study in CASEL my freshman year as a community coordinator, matching students with their ideal service opportunities from playing pool with Gary at the Senior Center every Wednesday to mentoring middle school students and helping them navigate through the awkward years to sleeping on the floor of the House of Charity in solidarity with homeless people. CASEL helped plant a seed for understanding that social justice takes on many faces. It helped me develop a commitment to the dignity of a human person. My Jesuit education has also led me to find a spiritual community here through St. Al's Young Adults Group. We're very active, planning social events, talking about theology at pub nights at Jack and Dan's, providing different small groups, and most importantly, meeting each other where we're at. Meeting people where they're at has, a, has fostered a safe space to revisit, re, revisit their relationship with God, a welcoming place to form new friendships, and a non-judgmental community to come to. After graduating with much angst about change and being surrounded by a completely different demographic of people other than bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, early 20-somethings wanting to set the world on fire, I entered into the real world. And to be quite honest, it was disheartening that not everyone had the same humanistic view of it that I had taken for granted in college. For a few years, I got stuck in what I call the autopilot grind, go to work for eight hours a day, come home, work out, eat, Netflix, rinse and repeat. I thought to myself, this can't be what the rest of my life is supposed to be like. So I took a scary step and I moved out on my own. I was living with a roommate at that time and I did a lot of self-discernment in the six months to follow. That half year was the loneliest I have ever felt, but my life needed this drastic change to shake me out of a two year too long slump. In this quarter life crisis, yes, it's a thing, I Googled it, <laughs> I experienced the most personal growth I ever have. I'm not sure if hindsight is always 2020, but I do know that being alone with my thoughts 24 seven allowed me to rediscover parts of myself that I forgot were important. Needless to say, it took quite some time to find my tribe or a good, system outside, a good support system outside of my family. I slowly started tapping back into my Gonzaga community, and, that's, and, that, and what surprised me was the frequency of one topic that always seemed to resurrect with fellow classmates, males and females alike. It was about how hard it is to make friends or date when everyone else seems to have their person or clique. In these very real and vulnerable discussions came about the early ideas for an interesting event that blended traditional speed dating with a modern twist emphasizing face-to-face -face time instead of screen time, which is a common complaint among users of dating apps these days. Through the Gonzaga alum board and help from many others, I was able to make this event come to fruition. It targeted recent grads. It involved a pre-survey, very Gonzaga-esque of me. Um, it asked questions like, what has been the most challenging thing about dating? What are some things that you would change about the dating world now? These questions were part of the registration process, and the results were presented at the event. 
This was neat to see because the answers reflected a good sample size of how 20-somethings felt about online dating with, while being very personal to the group that participated because it was their responses. It put some concreteness to the abstract or hard to articulate ideas that millennials, including myself, felt about the prevalent swiping scene. The actual event involved an inner circle of men and outer circle of women. A rotation was set up with time in between to review the last interaction. All matches were revealed via email later that week. The event was in high demand and received positive reviews. It even launched a broader collaboration with other universities on the West Coast wanting to put on a similar event for their alum. Gonzaga has always promoted impact and making a difference in your own unique way. And this weird concept was my unique way of addressing something in the Gen Y community that didn't have an answer. Though sometimes I entertain thoughts of being a matchmaker, my day job is actually electrical engineering. And <laughs> in a nutshell, I, power sh I troubleshoot circuit problems on the power grid with an emphasis on fiber optics. In keeping with the theme of Kira Personalis, I never saw my options in life limited to just engineering. So I have pursued other ventures to develop the right side of my brain. I'm currently working on a mural for Gonzaga in their alumni office and have had my multimedia art pieces displayed at Terrain, which is a uh, showcase of local artists here in Spokane. Some of these dresses were made of dictionary pages. I wove some telephone book pages together. This year's entry was made of pop tabs. And I've also dabbled in pottery, decorating homes, playing guitar, propagating succulents, aerial silks, and a handful of other unrelated interests. I think my eclectic side hustles or hobbies goes hand in hand with one of my favorite layers of Gonzaga's mission of continuing lifelong learning. In this, I truly believe we open ourselves up for new opportunities and our minds to other people and ways of life, which ultimately expands our human curiosity and sets us up to be better people for our global community. In my continued post-grad journey, it is so fitting that I never left Gonzaga. It has been the common thread for so much of my development as an adult, which sounds scary still. Not only has the school been a consistent resource for me, it has also been the unspoken bond that connects me to other people that I normally never would have interacted with otherwise. I think a lot of you will resonate with what I'm about to describe next. Have you ever been in an airport or on a desolate hike? or even on a completely different continent, and you spot someone from across the way that's wearing some type of GU apparel, and the next thing you know, you're just talking to them as if you've been friends forever. I mean, I think the, the phrase Gonzaga for life is so true. Look around. I would venture to guess that there's something about GU that you love that brought you back, or you love someone that loves GU, or perhaps you're back to relive some of those special memories made while you were here. I love this pride and how it continues throughout our lives as Zags. It's an exciting time to be a Zag, but it always has been, and I truly think it always will be. Thank you for letting me share my story. Oh, stay here, stay here. Uh, stay here, stay here. Stay here. How, wasn't that just awesome? Thank you for sharing all of your reflections with us. Kat has been on all of our minds, those of us that work in the alumni office, because she truly is painting a mural on the wall of Zag Nation outside of our office doors. So there is a ladder, Drew's here. There's a ladder in Drew's office and Kat comes in at night after her day job of solving problems for the world, comes in and paints. I hear you listen to great music too when you paint so much. <laughs> and every day when I come to work and we come to work, we get to see a little bit more of Zag Nation. It is truly incredible. We wanted to show you just a couple other of the things you referenced. Here is the gown that she made out of tele dictionary pages. Dictionary pages. Yes, and that was for Terrain last year, our art show here in Spokane. And yes, just a little bit of talent there. <laughs> And she was the one on the Spokane chapter board that said, nope, Zags need to meet other Zags. We have to do a dating event. And it, we weren't sure, but we did it last, last February, was it? Last Valentine's Day? 
We even sent our alumni chaplain just in case there were any matches that day. <laughs> Well, there are two people in the front row that I know are just beaming with this education at work in the world, and I'm going to introduce you to them because they are leading this education here at our university. But first, would you draw your attention to the video screen for a short commercial break? We are a university called to live and learn and teach and explore not comfortably at the center of the culture, but at the frontiers, the cutting edge, the margins, places that require courage. We're helping to produce students that can contribute to that greater good. And we need to help improve with respect to resources. You have the ability to, to put together something pretty special on this campus, but also in this community. It's, it's what our country needs. It's what society needs, is the individuals that graduate from a place like GU that have a solid grasp on the academic discipline, but also the ethics that come with it. I think we have to look at what is the demand? It is science and engineering and technology and medicine and healthcare. Those are the focuses of what the world is asking us. At the heart of what we do, this is an academic institution. And we really do need that kind of support for the classrooms where we meet with our students and engage with them every day. One of the things that I'm really proud about with Gonzaga over these last eight to 10 years is that we have never settled with the educational experience of our students. What do you think of that? Pretty exciting, come on forward. And we're really proud to get to report that just two weeks ago, we broke ground on this facility, our integrated science and engineering facility. And it wouldn't be possible without the leadership um, here on our campus of these two individuals. Correct me if I'm wrong, but we hear that 10 years ago, when some of you were here on campus, 25% of our students studied in the STEM disciplines. And today it's 45% and rising, right? So how, yes. Is it 60,000 vacant STEM jobs are predicted by 2030? Is that stat correct as well? Yes. Yes. Wow, I know my stats. Anyway, so what is Gonzaga doing to meet that demand? Well, we're really innovating, and it's thanks to both of you. We are, um, they are working true partners in their colleges, and we have our interim dean of our school, our College of Arts and Sciences, Matt Barr. Nice to meet you. Matt has been here for... I'm in my 16th year. In your 16th yeah. year. Yeah. With, and he has served in administra administration and teaching. Yep. What else? Uh, well, I started here as faculty, uh, did that for 12 years, and I've been working in college administration for the last five years as associate dean, and then stepped into the interim dean's role this year. Awesome. Thank you for being here. And we're welcoming to our campus and we are so grateful to have her and thrilled. She's been working so hard since she stepped foot here in June. 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 Of this year. Of this year, yes. Oh my gosh, she's hit the ground running. Dr. Carleen Hu from our School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Would you please give her a warm welcome? She's meeting our alumni for the first time. Do you have any other thoughts or any words you would like to say, any remarks about the building? What are you most excited about? So the Integrated Science and Engineering Building offers us opportunities to imagine something more than the individual to college and school. And the School of Engineering and Applied Science, uh, we feel that uh, where the science can take us into that discovery area, engineering and computer science takes us into the applied area. We ask, what do you do with this? What is the impact it can have on society? What are the new directions we can take on if we were to combine the, the science and engineering 
to create a workforce that can address questions that we haven't even thought about yet. We are creating that global scholar. And the Gonzaga value system doesn't just create the engineering computer science science scholar. A clear example is Cal. She saw more, she did more, she used all the values and skill set that we give our students to give her a career now, a career for the future, and so many other things that she intends to accomplish. So that's what I would add. Matt? Well, I was going to use Kat as an example. <laughs> I will say, we didn't collaborate before, so clearly we're not integrated in the way we need to be, but <laughs> we're going to get on the same page right now. No, I would say Kat, um, there are so many more cats out there, and that's what's special about Gonzaga. Um, students are coming here. High school students are being asked to do more and do it earlier and do it better than I think we've ever, uh, it's really changed in the last 5, 10, 15 years. Um, I've noticed that students are getting here really prepared to do special <coughs> things and they have high expectations and they've been asked to do a lot. And that continues through the college uh, years and what employers are telling us is that they want the skills and the habits and the sensibilities not only uh, that you get in well-trained STEM, science, uh, uh, neuropsychology, those sorts of fields, but they want whole person education. And so employer after employer after employer is telling us we want engineers and scientists and psychologists who have uh, read art or who have read literature and who have been exposed to art and philosophy and religious studies, a true kind of integrated whole person uh, that can come and contribute to their workplace, to their communities in ways that are going to advance not only their vocation or their company, but their community and their society. And that's what's really excited, that really excites me. Um, Carlene got here in, in June. June. Uh, she's a chemical engineer by training. Um, I don't think in rocket science, right? But mm -hmm. she's, she's added rocket fuel kind of energy to the enterprise. Uh, we started planning, yeah. we started planning this in 2014 and it's been a long road to get to the groundbreaking. And so we're really just excited to see the big machines come here and build this facility that will provide the space and the place for the kinds of integration and collaboration and, and, and student focus that we see in the coming decades. Awesome. So well, we are so excited for this new era of education and really being able to advance in the way that Gonzaga does it best, and that is together and collaborative. So big thanks to you both for Thank being you. here. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, you too. <laughs> and we're going to be bringing them on the road, so they'll be in a city near you soon, and you'll get to hear more about this story as it goes forward. We're so excited. And now it's time for our next speaker. We are here this weekend celebrating the class of 1999. Where are 99ers? 99, there they are. Well, something though happened in March of 1999 that really you probably remember no matter when you graduated. And if you don't, we're going to give you a little reminder of that. So please draw your attention back to the screen. Gonzaga very fortunate to keep the ball. Florida goes back into the zone. Shot clock turned off. Calvary, Hall, eight to shoot. Hall, the runner! Loose ball! It's good! With 4.4 to go! Shannon! Don't want to foul! Shannon from the corner! So we would like to, yeah, can we see it again? Well, we're going to hear a little bit more about it. Would you please help me welcome the man that's been in the driver's seat for this 99 year and even continuing to almost 21 years later. Please welcome our alumnus and athletic director, Mike Roth. Thank you very much. My good Luke? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, how many from class of 79 do we have in here? 
Now we're talking. So just for those of you that don't remember this, uh, I was here in, <laughs> as a freshman with you guys. Uh, I was a freshman. I lived in Catherine Monica, second southeast. So I was here for one year, then I left, came back in 82, 83 for another year, and then left, and I've been here since 1986. And uh, have had the pleasure of being our athletic director here at Gonzaga for uh, a long time now. And uh, we've got to see some very special things happen throughout this time, not just with men's basketball, but starting with men's basketball and just have escalated everything that we've seen from an athletic department standpoint, but also from a university standpoint. And I'm sure that if you've walked around campus, if you haven't been on campus in some years, you walk around and you see not just this beautiful building, but you see all the, the additional academic buildings, the Hemmingson Center, our student center, how great that building is, and of course our athletic facilities that we've been able to add. So it's been quite a run during this period of time. Uh, we, are, we don't have a whole lot of time, and for those of you, and we got our baseball guys up there, they've, they hear enough from me, they don't need to worry about it. I have a tendency to go long, and so I don't really want to talk about what I want to talk about today as much as I want to make sure that you ask me questions that you want to know about, and of course afterwards I'll, I'll be available. But, but please don't hesitate to throw a hand up and ask me a question as, as I move along here. Again, as, as Cara said, you know, we kicked this whole thing off in 99 when we caught lightning in the bottle, which we literally did. And if you think back to that time, again, Dan Munson was our head coach just his second year as head coach. His assistant coach was Mark Few and, and Billy Greer. Uh, I was just my second year as athletic director. I'd been here 10 years prior as the assistant AD, but I was my, just my second year as athletic director. And we made that run, and each step along the way, we had no idea what to expect, other than we had a lot of fun with it. And uh, we, you know, we were a couple baskets away from going to the Final Four, and that would have been a crazy experience for us, because we had no idea what we were getting into. Since all those years now, we've been to 21 straight NCAA tournaments. There's only, right now, we're, that's Gonzaga, Duke, Michigan State, and Kansas are the only schools in the country that have been to 21 straight NCAA tournaments in men's basketball. We are now in our 11th, we just finished our 11th straight year with a first round win. Uh, the last time we lost a first-round game in the NCAA tournament, we were just talking about it earlier, 79 classmate again, of uh, we were in Raleigh, and we were playing some guy that went on to play a little bit in the NBA. What was, anybody remember that one? Curry. Seth Curry and Davidson. That's the last time we lost a first-round game. So 11 straight wins in the NCAA tournament matched only by Kansas with their 11 straight wins. Nobody else other than Gonzaga and Kansas have had 11 straight wins in the NCAA tournament. We're, right now, we're on a run of five straight Sweet 16s or better. We're the only school in the country with five straight Sweet 16s or better. That's just in men's basketball. We got the baseball guys up there. How many rings do we have up there? How, seniors, how many rings do you have? Two, right? Two, last year's seniors had three rings. We win championships in everything. Okay, that's what we do. At the same time, our student athletes do extremely well in the classroom. Marco can quote me if, he, if I bring him up here. He can tell me what these three fingers mean. We're going to win in the classroom. Win on the field. Win on the field. And win in the community. <laughs> that's... I know the seniors up there could have quoted me too. That's what we do. And we, we don't just talk about it, we do it. We win championships in baseball, we win championships in, in women's basketball, men's basketball, women's rowing, golf, tennis. We had the number one ranked women's tennis player in the country this past year. Think about that. That's what, that's what basketball has built for us. It's, built, it's floated all, all boats from that standpoint. So again, I'll keep rambling unless you ask me a question that you want to know about. Everybody but Liz can ask me a question. <laughs> Liz, class of 99. Um, 
Well, that's a great question, Liz. Thank you very much. The, the, the one thing that we have never changed, and you know, I look at Coach Hertz sitting up here. Coach and I go all the way back to 1975. And one thing that we haven't changed, especially over these last 20-some years, 22 years, we've never changed who we are. We're, we're about the people. And that starts with the, the student athletes, but also surrounding with our staff, our coaches, our support staff, all those people. And we're, we chase those three things but we chase them in all the right ways. And we're never going to compromise ourselves for that. We're never going to be satisfied on one side. We will always strive to get better. But at the same time, we're never going to compromise who we are. And we know that that's what makes Gonzaga different. That's why everybody wants to know, you know what the secret sauce is. I, my phone rings constantly. Just this summer, I had the, the chair of the board of trustees, the president and the AD from Loyola Chicago flew out here to meet with me for a day to try to pick my brain on, on what we do, how we make this work. Now, for those of you that know me, think about picking my brain. That's pretty crazy because there's not much up in there. <laughs> but from that, it, it's a tremendous compliment to us as a university that other schools want to do what we've been doing because no one else has done this. No one else has been able to have this level of sustained success in all these sports. We have a champion that's with us here. Francesca Fairbanks is with us here, 90, class of 99. She was our first ever star cross country runner. Okay. <laughs> and her teammate Ann. Her teammate Ann was here. And, and, and again, now you look, we've, we have, we had, uh, Shelby Mills ran in the NCAA National Championship track and field in the steeplechase. Nobody would have thought of that years ago. Nobody thought we could do those things. We, the one thing that's key to Gonzaga is we believe. That's why I've stayed here all these years. That's why Coach Few stayed here all these years. That's why Coach Hurt stayed here all these years. That's why Coach Maktoff and his staff that are here with us have stayed with us all these years because we all believe in this place. Any other questions? Because I'm getting close to my time limit. Yes, sir. With the long dry spell between April and the first part of November when men's basketball kicks back in, when craziness happens, we're all salivating, wanting to see and hear more about the new squad. Have you given any thought to putting that online or making more of that amount available for us out in the hinterland, either, either the internet or the, the the craziness in the kennel part that we had last weekend. Yeah, I, I mean, again, we, we've got one of our social media people up there that he's making note of it, I can see in his head. Sure, I'm, I'm the last person to understand. You remember, I graduated in 79. I don't know how to turn a computer on. I don't know what social media is. But we will make sure, you know, that we'll look at that. We, of course, the craziest and kennel event. Tomorrow we're doing our fan fest with women's basketball free and open to the public and at 4 o'clock. Right, Todd? 4 o'clock. Uh, last week we did craziness in the kennel free and open to the public. There was two lines, one going south and the other going north that went forever. We found a way to squeeze everybody in there. It was lucky that the fire marshal didn't show up. But uh, we do our best to expose ourselves to the, the public as much as possible, and we love the support we get. And, and again, we've continued to have uh, you know, a tremendous amount of exposure. You think back to 79, or you think back to 89. We got group from 89 right up there, right? Yeah. Yep. And then, and then our 99s, we think back even when the 99s were here, Nobody could say Gonzaga. You couldn't buy anything that, 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 that was Gonzaga apparel, even our own bookstore. And, and nobody knew who we were in any way, shape, or form. Well, we've completely flipped that now in these last 20 years. We're not only a national brand as a university, and we're being ranked now as a national university from academic standpoint, but also now we're international with all of our international players that we get on all of our different teams, but when you bring in somebody like a Rui Hashimura in these last couple of years, the exposure that we've gotten for our university is tremendous, and we do it with really good people. 
Those guys up there, those baseball players up there, are really good people. They're 18 to 22 years old, qualifier. They do, okay. Think back to when you guys, this class of 79 right here, you guys were 18 to 22. They didn't have social media then, right? No cell phones, nobody was able to take pictures, but you guys did some stupid stuff, okay? These guys up there don't do as much stupid stuff, but again, they represent us extremely well. I'm out of time, but one last question. Mike Mark Soul, it's good to see you again. Good to see you. Yeah, we, we changed a tremendous amount. When we go back to, it wasn't until 1986, 87, that uh, anything other than men's basketball and, and baseball were Division I. At that point, everything else was competing in NAI, the sports that we did have. But now we have men's and women's basketball, um, men's and women's soccer, men's and women's cross country and track, men's and women's tennis, men's and women's golf, uh, Baseball, of course, volleyball. Todd, am I missing anything? Rowing, thank you, sorry, Geraldine. Yeah, men's and, women row, men's and women's rowing, which we're dedicating a new boathouse tomorrow morning. So we have 18 sports now. Uh, between both the men's and women's side, we have full-time head coaches in each and every sport. We have tremendous new facilities. We compete on a national level in every sport, uh, something that we couldn't have dreamt about 25 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago. So I wish I had more time. I could tell you all kinds of stories from that 99 run. And if you, we want to visit afterwards, I'd love to do so. But Carr has got the hook, and you're all here to listen to, to Marco and Monica anyway. Uh, again, two of our great you know, alums of our university in many, many ways. So Cara, take over. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. You baseball players aren't so bad. I did marry one of them and so did Monica. So you're all right by us. Thank you so much, Mike. Okay, so we are, we're gonna switch up our format just a little bit for our next guest. And it is um, such a pleasure to introduce them. They make their home in Seattle, as many of you know. And gosh, I think just two weeks ago, he was on the mound at T-Mobile Park in front of a crowd of more than 27,000 people pitching. And she is very much a partner in the baseball business, but also a health and fitness professional as well. And together, what makes us even more proud is they are partners in expanding our Gonzaga mission in Seattle, and they are partners for service in their community. So would you please help me welcome Monica Zeller Gonzalez and Marco Gonzalez. All right, now you're in the hot seat. Okay, can you hear us okay? Check. Check, check. So here you are back on campus. Woo, how does it feel? It's, uh, you know, I think we always look forward to the off season. We get a chance to kind of breathe a little bit, get a chance to reset. But then we start looking forward to, okay, when can we make our trip over to Gonzaga mm -hmm. to see our people? Right. Um, and like, you know, Mike has reiterated a bunch and we've said a ton, the people here are truly what makes it great. So, um, you know, we look forward to seeing all the familiar faces and catching up with everyone, people we haven't seen in a long time. So it's, it's awesome. Oh, it's, it's so much fun. It's so much fun to see the way that the university is growing and expanding even since we, we left campus. You left 13 and I left in 14, so it's, it's amazing. Yeah. How does it feel to have your fellow alumni teammate yeah, I was, or your teammates? I was shocked they showed up in baseball pants, too. I'm like, yeah. Man, you know, class it up, guys. Come on. <laughs> does that mean they go right back to practice after this? Is that how it works? Oh, Potent yes. Potent oh. Max, Max up there like, yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> it's a beautiful day. Get outside, you know? It is a great day, yes. Okay, so um, I'm a romantic, so, and some of you may be as well, but we'd love to kind of walk back in time. You were both freshmen here in 2010. Oh, oh there's the pictures. Oh. 
<laughs> See, we have other romantics as well. Marco was drafted by the Cardinals in 2013, and Monica, you graduated in 2014. So walk us through how you met and how you, what your relationship was like while you were here, because there was a lot going on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we met, uh, we lived in Catherine Monica. I mean, I think that's where most romance start, right? So. All co ed, uh, freshman yeah, dorm. I was, uh, Good times, I, I was right? Northeast, uh, Catherine Monica, and, and Monica was upstairs, and we had southeast. a lot of East. Southeast. Oh, um, where we Mike had, was. We had a ton of mutual friends. Um, you know, obviously a lot of mingling, a lot of socialization going on. So, um, you know, we were bound to meet. We had friends trying to set us up pretty much for the, when the year started. So. Um, you know, we, we got to meet each other, and I think the rest is kind of history, but yeah. Yeah, yeah we were, we were uh, around each other quite a bit, which was getting to know each other, and then uh, Marco really kind of pulled out the big guns in Valentine's Day of spring, our freshman year, and went all out, as he says, and got surprised me with chocolates and a card and took me on a very nice date oh. that year. Oh. <laughs> where to? Do you remember where he took you? Yeah. Rock City. Rock it's closed City. Down now. Rock it's closed City down. Grill, but so some sad. of us remember Rock City. It got closed down, so we're not sure if that's a good thing or what. We're not sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and um, yeah, and then I think from there, from there, we were together pretty much inseparable after that. And I think it was actually after your first win as a Zag that you yeah. asked me to be his girlfriend for the first time. Got it. I was feeling good. I was feeling good. You hear that Went guy? for it. Asked yeah. me after the first win. Yes, and then uh, I was working in the athletic department and for marketing and promotions for Gonzaga. So while well, he played baseball for the three years that he was here, and it was really the foundation of our relationship. It was so much fun being back there, especially because we, we had to go into long distance right after we graduated. Right. So right. really tribute our, the foundation of our relationship to Gonzaga being here. That's awesome. Good job, Marco. Valentine's Day. But then you were drafted. You were drafted in the first round, 19th overall in June of 2013. What was that experience like? And how did Gonzaga prepare you for it, to be a pro? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was great because the people and the teammates that I had at the time really, really kept me really grounded. The coaches did a great job of, of kind of keeping our focus on the field and with you know the current season ahead and when you're having that much fun and competing that hard for a school that you love that much I think it made it easy to kind of forget that the draft was coming up mm -hmm. and so it wasn't until we were done with our season that I was okay now we can kind of move forward we can go ahead but um, I really I don't know if it would have happened the same way had I not had the right people around me to help keep me focused through that because you could get distracted so easily thinking of what could happen. And if you're not stuck in the moment of, okay, got to put in the work, got to go win some ball games, then that might not have been the case. So um, it, it really, I attribute to the people I was around. Well, that's great. That's great. And then you began your pro career in 2013, made it to the big leagues and played in the postseason with the St. Louis Cardinals in 2014. But then injuries started to emerge. What were the hardships of that process? Did it, how did it shape your mindset and your career going forward? Yeah, so um, things were going really great. And in 2015, I started having some shoulder issues, um, just some pinching type things in, in labrum. And it's all, it's really science-y. It's not my, not my area of expertise, obviously. Um, but I think it just something that never really quite got right. And in 2016, in the spring training, I end up tearing a ligament in my elbow, um, your ulnar collateral ligament. Had Tommy John surgery to be able to uh, correct it, and that's a year-long rehab. So through that process, um, we're stuck down in Florida, uh, Jupiter, Florida, kind of isolated, not playing any games, not with a team. Um, you know, there's some, there could be potentially dark times in those situations when you're isolated like that. So um, I really just kind of learned to take it one day at a time, uh, one week at a time, and then kind of put my head down and, and let the process speak for itself. So um, I, I think, you know, that really instilled a good work ethic in me and made me accountable for a lot of things that, you know, maybe I took for granted coming up and the first part of my career. So that's what's really propelled me into where I'm at today is taking charge of, you know, my health first and foremost, putting in the right work, um, you know, on and off the field. I think that was, that was probably what's shaped it through that. 
Wow, that is a lot to process. Um, <laughs> and Monica, the question really applies to you too because you were in this with him. What were some of the hardships and the process that affected you? How did it affect you? Yeah, well, you know, it, that was definitely a, a trying time for, for anybody in that position. Mm -hmm. And it, it came right after we got married in 2015, right after we had been doing distance for a few years. And 2016 was the first year that I was traveling with Marco for the season. And we're geared up and ready to go. And then we get this challenge, this huge curveball essentially thrown at us that you, he had to go through Tommy John surgery mm -hmm. after several misdiagnoses. So I think it was really that, you know, baseball is really unpredictable. And that's something that was my first true taste in it. And it was the time that Marco and I truly had to rally together and to lean on each other. And here we are in Southern Florida, far, as far away from our community in Washington as we possibly could be. And we had to kind of dig deep and, and come back to our core values and, um, and dive into a new community together when it's just the two of us. It's not a baseball community surrounding us either. So, you know, I think it was a, a major growing experience for both of us. And it's something that we're both now thankful for that, yeah. that year. And it was also a time for our family that was difficult. We got some tough news for our, from our family side while we were in Florida away from everybody. So... Um, you know, rallying together and, and, and attacking that challenge together. They say, they say the first year of marriage is like the toughest and we were thrown right in the fire right away. Yeah. And I think that's what's made us so strong now from that is, okay, we've seen the, the grueling and brutal part of baseball, the business of what it can be and what life can throw at you when you've least, you know, can least predict it. And so I think being able to handle that, we treat it as though we can handle anything from there. Absolutely. No, you did good. You did good. So fast forward to July 21st of 2017. You're living in a studio apartment in downtown Memphis, Tennessee, and Marco gets a call saying he's been traded to the Seattle Mariners. What was that moment like? Yeah. <laughs> That's a phone call. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so the story behind it, we were playing, I was playing in AAA Cardinals, which is Memphis. We were playing a series in Oklahoma City, which is about an eight-hour bus ride. So we play on Thursday night, we bus overnight, we get back at 7 a.m. back to Memphis. And at this point, Monica was a personal trainer, so she's already at work. We don't even see each other. And so I'm in bed trying to go to sleep. We have a game, like, later that day. So the schedule is wild. Um, wow. And... <laughs> I get a phone call at like 10 a.m., wakes me up in the middle of trying to recover, and it's the assistant GM of the Cardinals, and he says, hey, I just want to thank you for you know, your hard work, your dedication, but we're trading you, and it seemed like it was like a year before he said the team name, because it was like, <laughs> to Seattle, and I shot out of bed, like wide awake, um, just kind of like, thank you, okay, yeah, appreciate it, okay, all right, bye. And all of that, right? And um, so that all happens, and I'm trying to call Monica. Um, Jerry DePoto from the, Mariner, the Mariners GM calls me, and he says, okay, great to have you. You know, we're excited. This is going to be great. This is awesome. Um, you know, your wife's from here. This is beautiful, all of that. And he goes, and we're going to need you on a flight tomorrow. So It was wow. that day. So it was like today. Well, he, when we pushed it back a day. I was like, push and it back. <laughs> so move. I ended up, that was yeah. Friday. I was on a flight Saturday, and I pitched in Tacoma for the AAA team Monday. And so it was wow. just a chaotic, oh, yeah. unpredictable ride. But it landed us in Seattle, and we were, couldn't be happier. Yeah. What was your reaction? Oh my gosh. Well, I was, as Marco said, I was teaching. I, uh, had, he hadn't seen him in a few days and had 5 a.m. classes that I was teaching and he's calling me off the hook. I'm like, he knows I'm working. What is he <laughs> doing here? Like, this is an issue. <laughs> and finally, he's like, call me right now. So I step out and he's like, are you sitting down? Uh -huh. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm, I'm working. And he's like, we're traded. And, you know, when the news hit, I just... I was like, you're kidding, started crying, and he's like, race home so we can call our families and tell our families, and before we had even seen each other, the news broke, so then our, both of our phones were kind of off the hook, and, yeah. and you know, I'm sure a lot of people here know, but most people don't know that we have no control over what team we're with, or for how long, so uh, for one of the 30 teams to have wanted Marco for it to be the Seattle Mariners, we were just, we were so happy. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. What a big phone call. <laughs> so we have some baseball fans in the room, Marco, um, and they might be wondering, what would you say um, are some of the biggest differences between the St. Louis Cardinals organization and the Seattle Mariners? I think it's really just about tradition. Um, with St. Louis, I mean, it's similar to New York Yankees, Boston Red Sox. I mean, just really, really rooted tradition and history um, in an organization that really does things the right way. And so they have kind of built a groove for themselves to have success. And everybody, I mean, just a lot like Gonzaga, everyone they bring in is just tuned up, ready to go, um, elite performers and elite coaches um, in every way. And I would say that the Mariners are in, in infancy stage of that. We're trying to figure out what direction we want to go. We're trying to figure out the right people to have in place. Um, but it's complicated. It's, it's a business and you have a lot of different sides of the game that are, have different motives into what they want and how they want to do their jobs. So we're trying to figure things out. We're trying to figure out um, a good culture to, to be put in place and have the right people. So um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to bring Gonzaga culture with me wherever I go. Um, but that's been a huge asset to me to be able to help be the one to build this culture in Seattle. And it's a huge honor. Yeah, wow. Well, you're now two years into your time with the Mariners and you two have become core members of this young rebuilding team. Um, how has that changed and what is your roles with them? Yeah, it, it's kind of weird because we're 27 and we feel very, very young in our career, in our endeavor here. But with this team, we're treated like veterans. And so to be able to kind of transition into a role where you're not comfortable yet, you're not sure if you're capable um, you have a lot of young guys leaning on you. You have coaches leaning on you. Everyone is asking a lot. Um, it, it's been a good year for us to learn that process and be comfortable. And I look forward to really, really big things um, for myself, but also from Monica being able to lead her community of people as well because she has a huge impact in the community too. Yeah, well, I from that perspective, as far as being a veteran wife on the mm -hmm. team and someone who's extremely passionate about the community that I'm in and uh, Marco and I are both extremely passionate about it being as helpful in the community as we can be. It's been a really wonderful opportunity and as Marco said, it feels a little early but we're to welcome these wives into our community and say, what can we do with this platform? We have an amazing platform with the Seattle Mariners and an amazing community to serve. How can we all do that together? And um, being able to kind of step forward and invite women into that and create that culture on the family side that a lot of people don't see um, has been kind of how our goal with it, my goal with it. And this was the first year that we've stepped forward and I've been able to truly lead a lot of the, those Mariners Care events, Mariners Wives events, and uh, we plan to do a lot more going forward. Yeah, that's you. so you lead the wives in several of these charity events, which is just awesome. Your Gonzaga education and leadership at work, um, especially in this last year. What were some of the organizations that you were involved with? Yeah, Marco, Marco and I are both extremely passionate about youth sports, so we really dive head first. And, and he's playing every single day. He's at the field every day, so I get to be the representative for us in the community a lot of the times. And... Youth sports is a, is a big thing in underprivileged communities. RBI, reviving baseball in inner city communities was a big one. We work a lot with Seattle Children's, uh, Fred Hunch Cancer Care. But this year we really dove into big time a partnership with a local, uh, a local company called Blazing Bagels to benefit multiple systems atrophy, a rare neurological disease, which is another facet that Marco and I are really diving headfirst into trying to raise money for. So Blazing Bagels was a great opportunity for us and we were able to create some more awareness and it was our first time really going into a platform, just the two of us, separate from the Mariners. And we were really happy with how it came out. And I think we have a little video from that event, right? We're here at Blazing Bagels today. Uh, we've partnered with Blazing Bagels to create some uh, great breakfast sandwiches. And with every sandwich, uh, we can promote awareness for a rare neurological disease called MSA. 
Um, every sandwich today that's sold, you get a chance to uh, enter a raffle to win a signed jersey. And we're hoping to just meet and greet with some great people, uh, spread some awareness, and, and uh, sell some bagels. For every Mr. or Mrs. Bulldog sold, a dollar will go to MSA Research, which is really amazing. There's no cure, there's no treatment. We need to create more awareness, raise some money for this disease. That's awesome. Wow. The Mr. and Mrs. Bulldog breakfast sandwiches. That is awesome. Oh my gosh. And we were just, our family was so fortunate. We were over in Seattle for a soccer tournament and were able to come and see it. It was really incredible. What was Thank the, you again yeah? for coming. Oh, it was just awesome. And I highly recommend it. Um, but what was the inspiration behind that? Well, the, the inspiration behind the Bulldog breakfast sandwich was, of course, Gonzaga. We had to bring over our Gonzaga yeah. representative over over into Seattle. But uh, multiple systems atrophy is a rare neurological disease, and it does affect someone in our family. And that was the news that we got and were fighting through uh, when we were in 2016 in Florida. And um, it's something that affects mainly the motor skills of the person and it's degenerative and there's no cure as I said and there's uh, no legitimate treatment for it so Marco and I of course are passionate about trying to raise awareness first and foremost and definitely fundraising for that for that terrible disease yeah. and it's something that we're going to continue to do next year as well it seems like it's the biggest focus for you of all of your charity work right now and community service work. Yes, absolutely. Well, that is awesome. You are Zags first, and now you are Mariners with a mission. Anyone who follows the two of you and the Seattle Mariners team really will see a lot of the exciting and fun things that you are working on. That's what we see. But um, people don't see the challenges and the difficulties that come with probably the business side of baseball. Mm -hmm. What are some of those challenges, if you can share them? Um, what are the challenges that you face as a couple and how have you overcome? You've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, early in your career, but how are those, how do you overcome them now? Yeah, it, it's just, we've gotten so much experience and unfortunately, but fortunately, we've seen some of the brutal sides of a business that can be kind of cutthroat when money gets involved in anything. It's very, um, you know, different intentions and, and people, um, you know, just kind of want to make money. They want to. They want to make a good business out of it. It's at the end of the day. So that has been that has been tough. But we've learned to deal with that and mm -hmm. be able to handle it better. So um, we're always getting better at that. But just as far as a marriage, I mean, we're spend so much time apart. And I think to a normal couple, we definitely do not have normal issues in our marriage. We have very complex things, um, things that we're not able to be together for. And so. Our communication has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our understanding of each other has to be perfect. And um, to be able to kind of her to give me grace when I'm exhausted coming home from the field or yeah. for it to go both ways. So I think we, we are a great pair. We call ourselves kind of entrepreneurs of our own life. Yeah. Um, we're trying to, f there's not really a path that's paved in front of us. So we're trying to make the best one that we can out of it. Yeah. yeah. Anything to add? He, uh, absolutely. I mean, he hit the nail on the head, of course, but, um, you know, I think for us, our biggest thing right now is we have a lot of goals and we have a lot of things that we're passionate about and we know that this platform that we're on can change at any minute. So mm -hmm. we talk all the time about how can we best use this time and this platform together and there really isn't a handbook, there isn't any structure like there is with several other jobs. So, um, you know, just trying to really nail down how can we do this, how can we reach these goals in the shortest period of time, yeah. on, leaning on one another. Well, you sure make us proud doing it. Sounds like a Gondega education at work in a very, <laughs> very different career. So that is, you guys are doing a great job. One final question. 
What's next on the journey for you both? <laughs> What's happening in the upcoming yeah. year and season ahead? Oof. Well, a lot. A lot, a lot. Well, uh, <laughs> we'll be doing our multiple systems atrophy awareness again and partnering with Blazing Bagels. So definitely come out to the Seattle area and try a Mr. or Mrs. Bulldog. I vote, I think the Mrs. Bulldog is pretty tasty. <laughs> Marco has ordered it a time or two on his own. <laughs> Um, and him and I both have, I think right now we, there's a lot of different directions we can go. We're trying to, that we want to go. Um, so we want to create our own foundation to really focus on rare neurological diseases and, uh, youth sports really hone in on those two things. Yeah. And we, we plan to represent ourselves here in Spokane as well sometime yeah. soon. Great. I think the great thing about, um, the people that we have in our lives is that, the connection that we have with one another is very genuine, it's authentic. So for us to sit here and be candid with you guys, be able to speak our minds, be able to come back and give back, that's all we've ever wanted out of the Gonzaga experience. And so I think we plan to not only impact Seattle, but Spokane, my home in Colorado as well. Um, we have some amazing people that we're gonna call on to be able to help us out with this. So look forward to bigger and better next year on and off the field. Uh, Learning we, and growing always. Yeah, we just hope to make everybody proud. Oh, well, I think you're on your way. I'm pretty sure I speak for everyone in this room that your Gonzaga family is cheering you on every step of the way. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Speaking of cheering them on, I have to let you know it's already on the calendar. Gonzaga Day at the Mariners is May 30th, right? How cool is this? Every ticket sold $5 goes to support Seattle student scholarships. So thank you for that. We expect over a thousand people at that event. So we hope to see you all there. Um, we are concluding our event now. We know you may have some questions and we've got to get this baseball team off to practice. I mean, I know Mac is ready, right? But if you have questions for any of our speakers, we hope you'll stick around and come and meet them and ask your questions. Our deans are here as well. So thank you all for being here. We have spirits and spirituality at Cataldo starting at six o'clock. Thanks so much, everyone.